record and share my screen. Oh, wait, I got to pull this up first. All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint now? Yes. All right, very good. Somebody said yes. I usually get a thumbs up from uh, Leslie, but I don't see her on the list right here. That's fine. If you can see the PowerPoint, let's just go ahead and get started. Now, last time, and pretty much every time, I know I go over and I try to you know, do as much as I can to, to save time. Last time I finished up with that last slide, I know a few people had to leave the room. Um, well, really the second or third to last slide where you see that negative feedback loop for uh, hypovolemic shock. You know that you need to look at that and know what the, those are the compensation mechanisms to try and restore blood volume and blood flow, blood pressure for people that have lost blood volume. So if you haven't watched that, the end of that video, if you had to leave, make sure you do that. All right. Um, that's on hypovolemic shock and the mechanisms that are employed in order to keep us healthy when we lose blood volume. If you have any questions on that, then, you know, just email me, but it's pretty straightforward if you follow it. All right, so we need to talk about the blood today. We have a lot to do in a short amount of time, so let's just get into it. Um, again, we're not identifying any pictures from this PowerPoint. Everything is going to be in a text format with regards to the question. But you have to understand, you know, the, what you're reading, which comes from the pictures. So that's why I always like to load up our PowerPoints with these pictures. So first of all, uh, if we take blood, a sample of blood, and we spin it down in a machine called a centrifuge, you can separate out into what you kind of look like right here on this picture in layers. So whole blood is composed of two things. What's, what is called whole blood is composed of a liquid portion that everybody knows the name of already. It's called plasma. 55% by volume of whole blood in your system is the liquid portion, which is plasma. And then the other 45% or so are all of the cellular components or what we call the formed elements. And you see two little layers here. One's called the buffy coat and one you see down here, it's all red. That's what we call the packed cell volume. That's all the red blood cells. <clears throat> so red blood cells are the most numerous of the formed elements of the cellular component. And that's why you see this big portion down here, it's all red. The little middle part right here is called a buffy coat. And when you spin down a uh, whole blood, this is where all of the, the platelets and the white blood cells settle out. So they settle out right here. And you can see it's not very much in volume relative to the red cells. So the red cells obviously take up the most volume in blood. So you should know what the buffy coat is and you should know that plasma makes up about 55% of whole blood. And then I know I'll put here red blood cells, 45%. The reason for that is because the white cells and platelets take up such a little bitty space, but really it's all of them. So this is about 45% of our whole blood. So the formed elements include red cells, white cells, and platelets. Um, and the plasma, which is mainly water, has a lot of dissolved solutes in it, including proteins. So the proteins that are in plasma, dissolved in plasma, are generically called plasma proteins. And we're gonna, we're gonna learn a few of them. You already learned some of them, like the transport protein for T3 and T4, thyroxin binding globulin, that's a plasma protein, it's in, it's in the blood. Um, all those transport proteins, uh, antibodies, which we haven't talked about, uh, albumin, which we haven't talked about, fibrinogen, which is involved in clotting, all sorts of things. There's hundreds and hundreds of different proteins in the plasma. And then all the solutes, electrolytes, your nutrients, waste products, those are all dissolved in the plasma as well. So here's what <clears throat> the formed elements look like. No, we're not identifying them, but we should know 
the scientific name for the formed elements. So most of y'all already know this. White blood cells are called leukocytes. The reason why it says neutrophil out here is because this particular leukocyte is a neutrophil. Um, the red blood cells are called erythrocytes. They don't have the science name for platelet here, but it's called a thrombocyte. So thrombocytes are platelets, <clears throat> which are pieces of cells. Um, and then this leukocyte down here is a monocyte. And again, we're not identifying them. This picture you see here is a scanning electron micrograph that's been falsely colored. So we can see the coloration. Obviously the, the red blood cell is red, white blood cells white, and these little pieces over here are platelets. So we're gonna talk about uh, these cells in a second and what they are, what they look like and what they do. As far as the functions of the blood, it's pretty simple. The blood transports everything around the body, everything. All the hormones that we learned in chapter 18, all your nutrients that you consume in your diet, waste products from all the cells in the body. Tom Parsons. Wait, go ahead. Good. All right, so it transports pretty much everything and the respiratory gases, which are oxygen and carbon dioxide. The blood regulates almost everything about the body, including uh, the homeostasis of all the fluids, extracellular and intracellular fluids in the body, controls how much water is inside the cells. Um, it's involved in controlling the pH in the fluids of our body, which we're gonna talk about more so in chapter 27. Um, in fact, out beside here, or in your notepad somewhere, I want everybody to write, because I think I forgot to put it in here, that the normal pH of blood ranges between 7.35 and 7.45. That's a normal range. So I want you guys to write that out here, the normal range of the pH. And then blood is involved in regulating body temperature because the water in blood helps transport heat. We can either conserve that heat, keep the blood in the core of the body, or we can dissipate that heat when the blood gets to the surface of the body. And then blood is involved in protection by clotting itself. If we break a blood vessel, we clot so we don't lose blood. And the white blood cells in our blood, the leukocytes, are involved in eradicating pathogens, infectious agents, to protect us against infection. All right. Now, as far as the white blood cells are concerned, lymphocytes are very special. <clears throat> They're a little well, a lot different from the other white blood cells. Lymphocytes are going to be talked more about in chapter 22 because those are the cells of our immune system. But obviously they have to be mentioned here because they're still blood cells. Leuka, uh, lymphocytes live for quite a long time. They can live for months and years um, in our system. And they are the basis as to why we can get immunizations and why those immunizations protect us against infectious agents for prolonged periods of time. The majority of other white blood cells may live only for a few days to a few weeks. It just depends on the white blood cell. When they're activated, they do their jobs and they pretty much die and we have to make more of them. Um, hemopoiesis, is the term used to describe the formation of blood cells. Another term for hemopoiesis is hematopoiesis. So hemo and hemato mean blood, and poiesis is the production of the blood cells. So we're gonna look at where hemopoiesis occurs and how it occurs. So this pluripotent stem cell, this weird term I put right here, are the stem cells that are located in red bone marrow. You guys remember that term, red bone marrow from AMP1? I think we mentioned that in like chapter six uh, when we do a uh, bone tissue. But red bone marrow is a tissue in our bones, specifically located wherever we have spongy bone. And loaded in that red bone marrow are these special stem cells called pluripotent stem cells that have the ability to undergo mitosis. Basically, they clone themselves through our whole life, so we never run out of them. 
And not only can they clone themselves, but they also get chemical signals to where they begin to develop and differentiate into other stem cells. So this pluripotent stem cell is called pluripotent because it has the ability to develop into many other cells. Stem cells can also be very dedicated, meaning they can only develop into a few types of cell lines. So whenever we have a stem cell that can only develop into a particular cell line or so, they're called a committed stem cell. So what you're looking at here is a flow chart of cellular development for all of the formed elements. All of the names up here are the names of the immature cells, the immature formed elements. And then all these lines represent the stages uh, or phases of their differentiation and development into the mature cells that go out into our body and do their jobs. So all of this development is occurring in red bone marrow, not out in circulation. It's inside our bone. So these pluripotent stem cells receive certain chemical signals which directs them to develop into these two committed stem cells, myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. On the test, I want you to know which formed element develops from which one of these committed stem cells. I know it looks kind of complex looking at all these lines everywhere, but here's how simple it is. I need you to know that the lymphoid stem cells only ever develop into T cells, B cells, and something called a natural killer cell. These, well, the T cell and B cell are lymphocytes. And then the natural killer cell, which is uh, very closely related to T cells, but their own class of cells, all of these are involved in our immune responses. So the only cells that come from the lymphoid stem cell basically are lymphoid formed elements. So if you know these, you get all of the other ones by default. For instance, red cells, platelets, the granulocytes, eosinophil, basophil, neutrophils, and the A granulocyte monocytes all come from the myeloid stem cell. Now we're not learning the developmental sequence of all of these cells but we will focus a little bit on this developmental sequence for the erythrocyte because we have to go through the negative feedback loop on how our body knows when to make more red blood cells and when to slow red blood cell production down because red blood cell production can go up or it can go down. Um, platelets are kind of a strange formed element. We're gonna talk about them. I have a couple of slides on them. Platelets actually are derived from a red bone marrow cell after it develops called a megakaryocyte. This megakaryocyte is only one of two cells in our body that are multinucleated. The other one, if you remember from AMP1, are the skeletal muscle cells. So skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei and so does the megakaryocyte. So this cell actually splinters off pieces of its plasma membrane, which encapsulates a little bit of, of, of cytoplasm and like mitochondria and other granules into these little structures we call platelets. So a platelet is not a complete cell at all. It's actually a piece of a bigger cell. So the platelets get into circulation. All of these cells get into circulation down here from red bone marrow. The megakaryocyte never goes into circulation. All right, so let's talk about the erythrocyte. Erythrocytes, red blood cells, as you know, carry oxygen. I think everybody knows that. It does a little bit more than that for us, though. Um, but we have to know some of its structure. So red blood cells happen to be a cell that is filled with a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin carries or transports oxygen to the cells in the body, and it transports carbon dioxide from the cells in the body 
ultimately as the heart's pumping it back to the lungs so we can exhale carbon dioxide out. Um, hemoglobin also transports another gas I'm gonna mention in a minute. It's called nitric oxide, if you remember that. You guys remember nit nitric oxide, the vasodilator? It's also transported by hemoglobin as well. Now, the molecule of hemoglobin contains four proteins bound together. Four polypeptides that are bound together makes a complex protein. And in the middle of each one of those polypeptide chains is something called a heme group. The heme group, each of them, contains one iron ion, one, each heme group. That means each hemoglobin molecule, which contains four heme groups, basically has four iron ions. Now, why is that important? It's because iron ions are the structure, the component in hemoglobin that binds to oxygen. And since you have four iron ions, that means each hemoglobin can transport four oxygen molecules. That's what that means. This is also the sole reason why we need iron in our diet. We don't use iron for anything else in our body. The only thing we use iron for is to make hemoglobin so we can transport oxygen. So as we get older, some elderly people have iron deficiency anemia. I'm sure you heard of that. And they have to go get iron supplements and things like that. It's because they can't make hemoglobin efficiently. The red blood cells also have no organelles in them, including no mitochondria. So there's no organelles in a mature red blood cell. They're ejected and dissolved before the red blood cell enters circulation. Technically, the nucleus is ejected once it gets into circulation, but they're all ejected. And the shape of the red blood cell is special. They don't look like a ball like other cells in the body. They're actually flattened out. They're caved in on both sides, which is called biconcave. So that biconcave shape serves two major purposes. It increases the surface area for gas exchange. Obviously, the red blood cells are carrying the gas, respiratory gases. And it increases the strength and flexibility of the cell. So the cells can go through those capillaries, which are very, very small in diameter, without being damaged. So they, they can flex a little bit. So here's what it looks like. Here's the shape of the red blood cell. We call this biconcave. If we look at it from the side view, you can see it's indented on both sides. So that indented area on both sides increases the membrane surface area that we can have gas exchange through. That's one importance of it. And then it can flex on either side around the concaved area. So it makes it flexible and, and strong all at the same time. The hemoglobin molecule itself is made up of these four polypeptide chains. Basically, these individual proteins are bound together once they're made. There's two alpha chains, as we call them, and two beta chains. So alpha chains and beta chains. Each one of these chains contains a heme group. Now this heme group, which looks like a little disc, it's kind of, it's planar shaped, is not a protein at all. It's a non-protein portion in the hemoglobin molecule. But the main interest here is the central focus in the middle. This iron ion in the middle is where oxygen reversibly binds. So when you breathe in, you load the blood with oxygen, oxygen comes here and binds to it. And then the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell totes that oxygen around the body. When the hemoglobin and red blood cell thus enters a tissue, oxygen will dislodge from the iron and go into the tissue cell. Now, while I'm on this picture, I'll give you a point of interest. I don't have a question on a test on it, but everybody knows about carbon monoxide poisoning, right? I'm sure you heard of that. Well, why does that kill us anyway? Well, carbon monoxide is almost like oxygen. It has one carbon on it and one oxygen on carbon monoxide. So what carbon monoxide does is it irreversibly binds to the iron. So that if you have a carbon monoxide bound to this iron ion, no oxygen can bind there and it renders this red blood cell useless.
for carrying oxygen. And so as you're breathing up carbon monoxide, you're basically taking all of your red blood cells out, out of the function of transporting oxygen and you suffocate, right? Because you can't transport oxygen to the cells in the body once all the red blood cells are filled up with carbon monoxide. All right, so that's the iron carrying oxygen for us. <clears throat> Here I put nitric oxide still being transported by hemoglobin. So you have three gases transported by hemoglobin, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can, but also carbon dioxide and nitric oxide is not being transported by the iron. Carbon dioxide and nitric oxide binds to the protein, these polypeptide chains, and then is released. So only oxygen is associated with the iron, not carbon dioxide and not nitric oxide. But the major point here is this, when we need to increase blood flow in a tissue, nitric oxide can be released from the hemoglobin and it causes vasodilation. Remember nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And we learned in chapter 21 that if we vasodilate a blood vessel, we decrease vessel blood flow resistance. We decrease resistance, which decreases the amount of pressure required in order to push the volume of blood through there. So by vasodilating, you increase the volume space for the volume of blood to get to a tissue and you increase blood flow. Now we also have an enzyme in red blood cells called carbon, carb, uh, carbonic anhydrase. We're gonna learn about this chemical reaction uh, a couple times this semester, but Carbonic anhydrase basically converts carbon dioxide and water into an acid called carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid, the way I wrote it here is technically incorrect, but it's sufficient for this chapter. Carbonic acid is actually broken down into bicarbonate in fluid. So the majority of our carbon dioxide is actually transported in the form being converted into this carbonic acid and thus bicarbonate. So we're gonna look at this chemical reaction uh, a little bit more when we get to the respiratory chapter. And also this chemical reaction that carbonic anhydrase catalyzes is very important for pH regulation, which we're gonna talk about as well later on. For now, all you have to know is that carbonic anhydrase converts carbon dioxide and water, they combine them together to form carbonic acid. So if you wanna write it down, which I didn't, since so we're gonna learn it anyway, carbonic acid is H2CO3. Whoops. And these numbers are subscript. I don't know how to subscript them. That's not how you do it. These numbers right here should be subscript down here. So when you're writing it in, I'm gonna erase it in a second. I don't wanna to have to spend time finding out how to do it. Uh, this would be H2, that means two hydrogens, and then CO3, and, this, and the three would be subscript as well. So that's carbonic acid right there. All right, now we have to talk about the life cycle of a red blood cell and how we recycle the components of a red blood cell and talk a little bit about how if you don't recycle red blood cells efficiently, how you can get very sick because there's some components inside the red blood cell in the hemoglobin that is toxic. So red blood cells have a dedicated lifespan. Give or take, you know, what's going on in the body, uh, whether people have, uh, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, hypertension, and things like this, the red blood cell lives for about 120 days. Could be a little less, might be a little longer, but the average is about 120 days. So ultimately, the dead or dying red blood cells have to be removed from circulation. And those dead or dying red blood cells are removed from circulation by macrophages that exist in the spleen and the liver, and also red bone marrow, I didn't put that down, but they're removed by macrophages. 
Now we're going to learn in a minute what a macrophage is, but those are phagocytes. I'm sure some of y'all know that already. So what happens when the macrophage phagocytizes old or dead or dying red blood cells and pulls them out of circulation? Well, there's a systematic recycling of all of the components that make up hemoglobin. And let's face it, red blood cells are nothing more than a bag of hemoglobin. There's no nucleus in them. There's no organelles in there. There's no mitochondria in there, nothing but hemoglobin and chemical reactions which occur in there. So this right here represents the macrophage. It's in your spleen, your liver, your red bone marrow. Any dead or dying or damaged red blood cells are removed from circulation via phagocytosis. The red blood cells are ruptured open and the hemoglobin is broken down into these components. The protein portion of hemoglobin, which is just called globin, all of those proteins are broken down into individual amino acids, which then re-enter circulation and are transported around the body in the blood so they can be used by other cells in the body to make more protein. Remember, all proteins are made from amino acids. So the amino acids or the globin portion, the protein portion of hemoglobin is non-toxic. There is a toxic component though. The protein is okay. That doesn't hurt us. We just reuse the amino acids. But what is the toxic component? Well, the heme group is removed from the protein. So basically, this little yellow disc with the iron is pulled away from the protein. All the protein polypeptides are broken down into individual amino acids. And then this heme group is split open. You see how it's a ring? These bonds are broken, so they break open and basically open up the ring. The iron is then released from the middle of the heme group. So when we release that iron, it's transported in the blood by a protein called transferrin. This transferrin protein brings our iron from the broken down hemoglobin to your liver. The liver is where we store our iron. So I don't know if you ever heard that, but if you eat uh, liver in your diet, you get a lot of iron. You ever heard of that? That's because the liver stores a lot of iron for us. So ultimately that iron being stored in the liver as a form called ferritin can re-enter the blood and be transported back to red bone marrow so that we, by transferring, transports it to red bone marrow so we can use the iron to make more hemoglobin. You cannot make hemoglobin without iron. That's why people with iron deficiency have anemia because they can't make hemoglobin appropriately. Now, the reason why they show the proximal end of the femur here is because there's a lot of uh, red bone marrow in here. There's a lot of spongy bone up inside here and that and wherever you have spongy bone is where red bone marrow is at. So basically we can use our amino acid to make more hemoglobin. You can reuse the iron to make more hemoglobin. But what happens to this little yellow disc after we take, after we split it open and we take the iron out of it? What happens to it? Well, it turns into a pigment. The pigment that it turns into is called Billy Verdon inside the macrophage. Billy Verdon is converted to a yellow pigment. Chemically, this molecule is broken down into another pigment we call bilirubin. So you might know this term. Bilirubin causes jaundice. I'm sure you heard of that. So bilirubin is a toxic compound. We have to handle bilirubin very precisely and efficiently so we don't get sick. So bilirubin enters the blood and goes to the liver. The liver has the job of secreting bilirubin into the duodenum, the small intestines, with bile. So the liver produces a product called bile, is secreted into the small intestine, and it's one way that we can excrete waste products. So here's a waste product. We have to get rid of it. So bilirubin gets into the intestine, and it's then chemically modified again by bacteria. So all the bacteria in the intestine converts bilirubin into another pigment called urobilinogen. 
Now, urobilinogen has two fates. It can be reabsorbed through the lining of the large intestine, the colon, back into the blood and be sent to the kidney where it's excreted out in urine as urobilin. It's a light yellowish pigment. Kind of makes your, your urine kind of light yellowy in color. So yeah, we excrete certain hemoglobin red blood cell breakdown components in our urine. It's in the form of this pigment. The second fate of urobilinogen is it's actually broken down again by bacteria into a brown black pigment called stercobilin. So this stercobilin pigment is what makes your feces a kind of a brown color. So we're actually ex constantly every day excreting the breakdown components of red blood cells out in urine as a pigment called urobilin and out in our feces as a pigment called stercobilin. All right, so on the test, I want you to know the breakdown components of these pigments, all right, and how we handle the iron and the amino acids from the, heme, uh, from the globin portion of the hemoglobin molecule. All right, so does anybody have any questions about that? All right, so just follow your chart. Wait, go ahead. Can you repeat that, Dr. Russell? Repeat what? Repeat, I know you said no breakdown components of pigments, and then what did you say after that? Oh, yeah, I just want, yeah, that's it. I just want you to know, basically just follow your flow chart that you see here. You need to know mm -hmm. the breakdown mechanism for these pigments. So you know the okay. heme group is converted to biliverdin once the iron is taken away from it. Mm -hmm. Biliverdin is converted to bilirubin, which if this pigment builds up in your blood, like in liver failure, if your yeah. liver is failing and you cannot secrete bilirubin into the intestine, like in alcoholics or people with hepatitis, viral hepatitis or drug abuse, bilirubin backs up in the blood and it makes people jaundice. Okay. This yellow pigment builds up in our skin and our other organs and it can kill us. This is toxic. So we have to get rid of it. How do we get rid of it? Well, we send it to the liver. The liver secretes it in bile to the intestine, and then it's broken down to these other pigments, and we get rid of it in urine and in feces. So just know the breakdown components of these pigments, all right? Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, let's talk about how we make the red blood cells. So like all formed elements. The formed elements are produced in red bone marrow. Now some of the formed, most of the formed elements are produced in the red bone marrow and they gain their function in the red bone marrow. There are two exceptions to that rule. I'm not talking about them today, but those are the lymphocytes and that is a discussion for chapter 22. But nonetheless, the production of red blood cells is specifically referred to as erythropoiesis. So if you remember, I, I said a word earlier, hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. So if you see hemopoiesis, it just means blood cell production in general. But if I say erythropoiesis, it's specific, specific for red blood cell production, right? Now, all blood cells, formed elements are produced in a red bone marrow. The production of the formed elements is based on certain growth factors or hormones that are secreted in certain areas of the body. The red blood cell hormone that's important is called EPO. I introduced that in chapter 18. It's called erythropoietin. It's produced by the liver. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, by the kidney. So the kidneys are sensitive to how much oxygen is in our blood. And it's oxygen loads in the blood that directly govern how fast erythropoiesis will occur. And thus, how much, e I'm sorry, erythropoiesis will occur. And thus, how much erythropoietin will be produced and released by the kidneys. So we're going to go over that. It's a negative feedback loop. It's not too terribly difficult. So we're going to go over that. Um, before we do that, let me define what a reticulocyte is. So a reticulocyte is 
an immature red blood cell that, that's shaped like a ball. We actually call it a spheroid. It's shaped like a sphere. Remember earlier, I said red blood cells are indented on both sides, which is called biconcave. So this is what a mature red blood cell looks like. A reticular site, though, on the other hand, looks like a ball. And it hasn't ejected the nucleus out yet. So it takes a couple of days. Once the red blood cell develops into a reticulocyte, the immature red blood cell develops into a reticulocyte, the reticulocytes are the cells that enter circulation from the red bone marrow. But within about a couple of days or so, you know, they say one to two here, but it's, it could be anywhere from one to three days, the cell kicks out the nucleus, so there's no more nucleus. And it flattens out into that biconcave shape. So this is a mature, immature red cell, and doctors can do what's called a retic count. They can count your reticulocytes to see how efficiently your red bone marrow is functioning to make red blood cells. I'll put a little animation in here. You can uh, view that, and we're going to learn the feedback loop off of this chart. So the governing stimulation to control how many red blood cells are made, the stimulating factor, I should say, is the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. How much oxygen is in the blood means something. So if we start at the top, there's some kind of stress or stimulus that disrupts homeostasis by decreasing oxygen delivery to the kidneys and the other tissues in the body. Luckily for us, the kidneys are sensitive to low oxygen. So the cells in the kidney that are sensitive to low oxygen say, hey, we don't have enough oxygen. We better release EPO, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin then circulates down to its target, which is located in the red bone marrow. The target for erythropoietin is also called the control center, which is a stem cell called a proerythroblast. This proerythroblast basically is an immature cell that develops into red blood cells. So I'm going to go back and show you that on our sequence chart. The proerythroblast is basically a committed stem cell. The only cell that a proerythroblast could ever develop into is a red blood cell. Now, how quickly the proerythroblast develops and differentiates into a reticulocyte depends on EPO, erythropoietin. So all of this, remember, this developmental sequence of all the formed elements occurs in the red bone marrow. So the kidneys dump out EPO, which circulates down to the red bone marrow. EPO binds to receptors on the proerythroblast and causes for the production of, I know this picture is incorrect, they show a mature cell here, but it develops into reticulocytes. The reticulocytes then enter circulation from the red bone marrow, and within a couple of days, they turn into the mature red blood cell. So the more red blood cells we produce, the more oxygen we can transport. So this negative feedback loop is going to run and run and run until the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood increases. And then the kidneys say, hey, we have enough oxygen. We can stop releasing EPO. And thus the proerythroblast stop developing down into reticulocytes and our loop shuts off. That's how easy it is. Now I'll give you an idea of how this, how much this is working. Every single second of every day that you're alive, your red bone marrow produces 2 million red blood cells. I just produced 2 million. I just produced 2 million. I just produced 2 million red blood cells. However, every single second of every day that you're alive, macrophages are pulling 2 million red blood cells out of circulation. So for that reason, the amount of red cells that we take out of circulation 
about balances the amount of red blood cells that we put back into circulation. And that's why the number of red blood cells say about the same. And that's exactly what we want. See, you don't want to make too many red blood cells more so than what you're pulling out of circulation because then you're going to have polycythemia and your blood's going to get too thick or viscous, which increases resistance and increases your pressure. All that stuff we talked about in chapter 21. All right, so let's move on to white blood cells. The white blood cells are grouped into two different categories. White, all the white blood cells also have nuclei in them. Red blood cells don't. And red blood cells have hemoglobin, but no white blood cell has hemoglobin. So they're different with those respects. So the leukocytes are classified as either granular leukocytes or agranular leukocytes. The granular leukocytes include neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. We're going to learn what they do in a minute. And the agranular leukocytes are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. So we're going to talk about them briefly, the lymphocytes, but we're going to look at them more closely in chapter 22. Now, the white blood cells all function in some form or manner to help combat invading microbes in our body. They also help in tissue repair, allergy attacks. All of these things are inflammatory in nature. So some of the white blood cells are inflammatory, some are, are anti-inflammatory. But all of them, I don't say all, the majority of them do their jobs once they leave the circulating blood and enter a tissue. Yes, our white blood cells can leave circulation and enter tissues to do their job. So when a white blood cell leaves circulation and enters a tissue, it's called immigration. Now in my note packet, you're gonna see the older term for that. The older term for immigration is called diapodesis. So let's look at immigration. It's not too terribly difficult. White blood cells have receptors on them called integrins. So I want you to know these receptors. Here's the bottom line. Here's some white blood cells, specifically this is a neutrophil, and they flow through the circulating blood and where they become sticky on the surface of the blood vessel, typically in venules and capillaries where this occurs, these integrins, which the artist colored in green, stick to the receptors on the endothelial cell called a selectin. So the integrins stick to the selectins and it makes the white blood cells sticky and they start rolling on the wall of the blood vessel. That's called just rolling. Then they get stuck on a certain part of the wall, like a fly on fly paper. They just get stuck. And where they get stuck, they squeeze out of the blood vessel like this. So once the blood cell, white blood cell leaves circulating blood and enters a tissue, we say that it has immigrated. And then out here is where the majority of them do their job, right? So this is called immigration. I want you to know where the integrins are and where the selectins are. That's the importance off of this picture. I'm not putting the picture on the test, just know where the receptors are and they're used in immigration. Now I include this slide in here because I think it's important. Um, I'll have a question on it, but it's, you don't have to learn both columns. So if you look at this uh, table right here, you see the white cells, the granulocytes and the agranulocytes, right? The neutrophil, lymphocyte, and these are in order of most numerous to least numerous, by the way. So I know in lab people ask me, do you need to know it's 80% and less than 1%? No, I didn't. We're not learning those percentages for lab. We're also not learning the percentages for here, but you should know the order of how concentrated they are. So this is the order in which they occur, all right? Now, that's not the most important thing. I probably don't even have a question on that. What's important is how do the white blood cells change in number? There are certain things, conditions in our body, infections that cause different white cells to increase in number. An increase in uh, white blood cell number is called leukocytosis. That's a term we use for that. So, and if white blood cells decrease in number, it's called leukopenia. 
and leukopenia is never good. You don't want your white cells dropping in number, then you become vulnerable, right? So all you have to look at is this column right here. What types of infections or conditions cause an increase in these different types of white cells? Just, so just review this column. You don't have to learn this when you can. I mean, it's all interesting and you're gonna have to know it one day, like when you go to nursing school. But So you can just keep this handy. But the one reason why I don't do that is because you're always having these little charts handy that tell you what cells increase or decrease. So just look at the high count. You could look at the low count if you want on your own. All right, so we're gonna talk about platelets a little bit more in a second. Um, but before we do that, I'm gonna introduce platelets now. We're gonna look at the tables for their functions, and then we're gonna get back into platelets and blood clotting, all right? So platelets come from megakaryocytes. You need to know the name of this cell. You don't have to know that the cell splinters off two to 3,000 times, but you do need to know that the megakaryocyte splinters into little bitty fragments. The megakaryocyte does not leave red bone marrow. It pinches off pieces of its membrane. It's called fragmentation. So it fragments into little bitty pieces we call platelets. The platelets are actually produced under the influence of several different hormones. The primary one is called thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin, which I didn't write here, you should write it in, is produced by the liver. It's also abbreviated TPO. Thrombopoietin is abbreviated TPO. So the liver produces thrombopoietin. It then circulates to red bone marrow where it stimulates the production of megakaryocytes from the myeloid stem cell. So the megakaryocyte develops and then splinters off or fragments into platelets. And the platelets only live for about a week or so. And we have to keep turning them over as well, just like red blood cells. But before we get into blood clotting, I put some tables in here that will help learning their functions a little easier because it's all in one place. There's only really two columns you're, you're worried about on these tables. Number one, you obviously need, need to know which cell type you're talking about. So column over here with the names of the cells in it. You have to know which cell it is. Then over here for function, just this column. Don't worry about how many there are in the blood. Don't worry about how large in diameter they are or the other uh, chemical and physical characteristics. Don't worry about this. I just want you to go through the column with their functions. So you know what these cell, what the white, what the neutrophils do, eosinophils and basophils. For instance, neutrophils are phagocytic. They can perform phagocytosis. That's not their main role, but they can do it. Um, neutrophils are very effective at killing bacteria. Why are they? Why do they kill bacteria pretty effectively? Well, they release several different enzymes and compounds that destroy bacteria very easily. They make an enzyme called lysozyme that breaks the cell walls of bacteria down, makes them lice open. They produce sturdy proteins called defensins. They're like little bitty spears. When they exocytose these little spears out, it pokes holes in the bacteria. Neutrophils also make strong oxidants that cause major oxidation of all the bacterial molecules and kills it. Um, one of the most powerful ones are superoxide uh, anion, which is a very reactive oxygen molecule. It's, a, it's an anion oxygen molecule, has an extra electron on it. They also make hydrogen peroxide and bleach. Bleach is a uh, main uh, molecule in there is called hypochlorite anion. So see, just know those things for each one. And I'll have some questions on that. The functions of the white cells. The other ones are on this slide, the lymphocytes uh, and the monocytes and the platelets. So you don't have to know these two columns, just the column at the very end for their function. Now we're gonna go into hemostasis specifically now in what the platelet roles are. So. Uh, I actually have that listed out on these slides right here. So we have a couple of things in this packet left to cover. Hemostasis and blood typing. I'm going to try and finish it today so we can do the digestive system on Thursday. But again, if I go over a little bit and you have to leave the room, that's fine. Just make sure you view the video. All right. 
All right, so the next thing we have to talk about is how we stop blood from leaving a broken vessel, which we call bleeding, right? How do you stop bleeding? Well, the stoppage of blood flow out of a broken vessel is called hemostasis, by the way. That, just, just that word means the stoppage of blood flow. So there's three mechanisms involved in our body for stopping bleeding. Everybody knows the last one. We know we clot our blood, right? But you may not know these. Automatically, when we cut a blood vessel open, we get smooth muscle contraction. It's an automatic response. So you start to have vasoconstriction and venoconstriction. That's just called a vascular spasm. It decreases the diameter of the blood vessel to decrease blood flow through a broken vessel. Then the platelets start to become activated and they produce a plug. It's called a platelet plug. So platelets, as you might already know, are involved in blood clotting. But why are they involved in blood clotting? That's what we're about to learn. They actually form their own little plug first and then jumpstart the process of blood clotting along with some other uh, signal, signals that, that started. And we're, we're gonna cover them. So before we go into what a platelet plug is and how it forms, let's see what platelets have inside of them. Remember, platelets are not a whole cell at all, but they do have several different granules in their cytoplasm in there that contain a lot of chemicals. And those chemicals are very important. And they're, in some form or fashion, they're all involved in forming the actual plug and or starting the process of blood clotting. So the two main granules are called alpha and dense granules. You should know what is in each one of these, all right? So for instance, alpha granules contain some clotting factors, not all of them, but some of the clotting factors are in this alpha granule. The alpha granules also contain the growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, which is involved in helping repair the damage that we've done when we broke a vessel open. You cut your skin, you cut the blood vessel open. So this is one of the signal molecules that starts the repair process. The dense granules contain several factors, which the majority of these are involved in forming a platelet plug. One of them is involved in both, but uh, you know ATP, you heard of that before, and ADP. Well, ATP becomes the energy molecule for the chemical reactions that require energy inputs. ADP is like a glue. It makes the outside of a platelet sticky once it's released. These granules are going to release their contents once the platelet is activated. So the ADP makes the gran uh, platelets sticky so they can stick to each other. Serotonin and thromboxin A2 brings about a vascular spasm. Fibrin stabilizing factor is actually clotting factor number 13, Roman numeral. So yeah, I hope, hope you guys know your Roman numerals. We're gonna learn a few factors in a minute. So the clotting factors uh, are all designated with Roman numerals, except for four of them have a name. We're not learning those. But fibrin stabilizing factor comes from a dense granule. It's actually called clotting factor number 13. It helps stabilize the blood clot, thus its name. All right, so let's look at a platelet plug and then go through the steps of blood clotting. So let's say you break a blood vessel open. Boom, you cut down through your skin, you cut into a blood vessel. Obviously, you're going to bleed some. We all know that. What you probably have never thought of, when you cut down through a blood vessel, which is the only thing I really don't like about this picture, they don't really show it too well, but when you cut down through the blood vessel, you're cutting the epithelium, you're cutting your, your uh, connective, uh, dense irregular connective tissue in the dermis, you're cutting the connective tissue and the endothelial lining of a blood vessel. And the reason why all of that's important is because when you cut down in there, all of the collagen fibers in that connective tissue start to poke to the inside of a blood vessel. Now, those collagen fibers are like iron poles to a cell that is passing. They're very strong and sturdy. So the platelets that are passing this area hit those collagen poles, so to speak, and it deforms their membrane. Some of them even rupture open. So how do we activate platelets? It's very simple. Whenever a platelet membrane is deformed or the platelet starts to become damaged or ruptures open, platelets become activated. 
This is exactly why people that have fatty plaques in their arteries can throw blood clots even if they don't break a vessel. And that's bad, right? That's called thrombosis when we make clots inappropriately. So if you have a big, say you have a big fatty plaque built up right here, a platelet could come along at a high speed and hit it, boom, and then damage it and activate the platelet. And that way you just activated the platelet to form, help form a blood clot in an unbroken vessel. So the reason why I tell you all that is because platelets become activated when they become damaged, basically. So now you see, we go through what's called platelet adhesion. The platelets start to adhere to the site of damage of the blood vessel. They then go through a release reaction. All the alpha granules and the dense granules release their contents. The serotonin, thromboxin A2, calcium, ADP, ATP, stabilizing factor, all of that stuff off of this slide over here, all these clotting factors and compounds are being released during the release reaction. Now, that also helps recruit other platelets to the site of damage, and that's called aggregation. So all the passerby platelets start to stick together and are recruited in to where all of these platelets are activated. And we then start to form the plug. So it's pretty simple. Platelet, platelets adhere to a site of damage. They start to become activated because they're deformed. They go through a release reaction. All their chemicals start to uh, recruit other platelets. And, and so they can stick together, which is called aggregation. And all of those chemicals begin the formation of the clotting protein called fibrin. So the artist drew in some fibers in here. I don't know if you can see it too well. So these little bitty fibers that you see here, that's the beginning of a clot formation. So all those platelets help start the clot formation. And that's why if someone has a low platelet count, they don't clot their blood very well, right? So here's electron scanning electron micrographs of different stages of the clot, fibrin clot formation. Um, again, I'm not putting the pictures on the test, but you can see here, this is an early stage. You see the red cells. You see a few fibers in here and some platelets. Then you see an uh, intermediate stage where the fibers are getting stuck together. They're more numerous. They're a little thicker, and they're starting to uh, collect and block up the red blood cells. And then down here, these are late stages of the clot formation. And you can see all these fibers, they're called fibrin threads. So the whole result of trying to clot the blood to produce a blood clot is trying to perform a bunch of chemistry to make this molecule, fibrin. Fibrin is an activated form of a plasma protein called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is soluble in plasma. When we activate fibrinogen to fibrin though, it becomes a solid filament. So this fibrin is a solid, filamentous protein that has precipitated into the wound site and like a net catches all the red blood cells and prevents it from passing that point. <clears throat> Over here, they show a real blood clot. <clears throat> uh, another scanning electron micrograph. Uh, you can see how a blood clot can just fill up that vessel in that, in that wounded site so the blood can't pass that spot. So our job for this chapter for this section is to learn these three stages of blood clot formation. So I'm gonna try and say it as simply as I can so we can go into blood typing. You need to follow the chart and it involves three stages. First of all, the end result of, and this is all three different chemical, biochemical pathways, the three stages. The end result of all of this chemistry is the formation of this solid protein filament, fibrin. Stage one is the most complex because it actually involves two different biochemical pathways. But both of these biochemical pathways, even though they involve different clotting factors, the end result is exactly the same. Look at the end result at the end of what's called stage one. This is stage one at the top. The final end product of stage one is prothrombinase. 
So both what's called the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway produce the same exact product. It's called prothrombinase. Now, blood clotting is a very regulated mechanism, biochemical pathway, in this manner. In other words, stage one would have to occur first to produce prothrombinase before stage two could even occur because the final product, prothrombinase from stage one, is required to jumpstart stage two. The end result of stage two is an enzyme called thrombin. The production of thrombin from stage two is required before stage three can be completed. So you guys see how that works? Stage one, you gotta make prothrombinase in order for you to make thrombin at stage two, and you have to make thrombin at stage two before you can make fibrin at the end of stage three. So this is a very regulated sequence of events that have to happen in order. So let's go through stage one. Now, there are over 20 different clotting factors. On your note somewhere, or in your PowerPoint if you have it out, I need you to write in right here, activated factor seven. Let me see if I can write that in. So if all the factors that we're learning here have Roman numeral designation. So factor seven was left out off of this picture for the in extrinsic pathway. Factor seven looks like that. I'm sure you guys know your Roman numerals, right? So factor seven is involved in the extrinsic pathway. And it works this way. The extrinsic pathway has a stimulating factor that activates factor number seven. Factor number seven is activated by something called tissue factor or Thromboplastin. Factor seven is activated by tissue factor or by thromboplastin. Does everybody get that? Tissue factor is just a newer name. You're going to see thromboplastin in my note packet. So I forget which one I use as, just know both of the names. So what is tissue factor and thromboplastin? Well, it's a bunch of distress molecules that come from you breaking open all of your tissues in your blood vessel. I mean, remember, you just cut down through your skin. You cut your epithelium, you damage all those cells. You damage your dermis. You cut this uh, blood vessel open. All of those damaged cells release a bunch of compounds that activate factor number seven. So all of those damaged cells releasing their cytoplasm and platelets, I'm sorry, phospholipids and compounds, is called tissue factor. So it activates a factor number seven. Now, in the presence of calcium, almost every single step requires calcium. You cannot clot your blood without calcium, by the way. So in the presence of calcium, activated factor number seven activates factor number 10. Now, all of these factors are flowing in your blood. So activated seven activates 10, and activated factor number 10 actually binds to activated to, to binds to uh, factor number five to form an activated complex called prothrombinase. So if you wanna know what this enzyme really is, it's a combination of activated factor 10 and five bound together. <coughs> so activated factor 10 and five are bound together to form this enzyme. Now, once we get prothrombinase out, stage two can begin. So what does prothrombinase do? Well, prothrombinase activates clotting factor number two. Clotting factor number seven, by the way, and factor number two is produced by the liver, along with clotting factor number one. So clotting factor number two is called prothrombin. So what activate, and these are proteins, by the way, 
What activates this protein? Well, the enzyme called prothrombinase. See how it's prothrombin in the name? Prothrombinase is the enzyme that activates prothrombin into thrombin. So prothrombinase has to be produced first, which is activated factors 10 and 5, to activate prothrombin, which is factor number 2. When prothrombin is activated, it's turned into thrombin, which in its own right is an enzyme. And once we get thrombin out, it activates clotting factor number one, which is called fibrinogen. It's produced by the liver. And fibrinogen is a soluble protein. So if we want to make a blood clot, we need thrombin to activate fibrinogen to turn it into an insoluble protein fiber called fibrin. You see, we want that protein fiber to precipitate out of the blood, out of plasma, to look like this to make a big mesh of protein that clogs up all the cells in that spot. So that's what fibrin is. It's a solid protein filament. Fibrinogen is soluble. Fibrin is insoluble. Now that's the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway does the same thing. It produces prothrombinase, but it does it utilizing different clotting factors. <coughs> now, Clotting factors number 8, 9, and 11 are involved in the intrinsic pathway. They're just not on this flow chart. So you don't have to worry about them. I'm not going to write them on the test. But clotting factor number 12 is a central location. So 8, 9, 11, and 12 are involved in the intrinsic pathway. So in the intrinsic pathway, the damaged platelets are releasing clot clotting factors the damaged endothelial lining and the endothelial cells themselves from the blood vessel, all of that damage activates clotting factor number 12. So yes, there are some clotting factors that can be activated by the damaged platelets and the clotting factors in there and the damaged endothelial cells. Factor 12 will be activated. Now, when factor 12 is bound by calcium, Factor 12, like factor 7, activates 10 and 5. So there's basically two ways to activate 10 and 5. Factor 12, activated 12, can activate 10 and 5 to produce prothrombinase. And activated factor number 7 can activate 10 and 5 to produce prothrombinase. Now, the reason why the intrinsic pathway is so important is because it's really the intrinsic pathway that produces the majority of the prothrombinase for us because of a positive feedback loop. Once the intrinsic pathway gets started, which takes a little bit longer because there's more chemical reactions than the extrinsic pathway. But once it does get started and produces prothrombinase, it actually produces more and more and more and more prothrombinase over and over because of this positive feedback loop that works this way. When we get prothrombinase out, we get thrombin out. When you get thrombin out, it causes more activated 10 and 5 to produce prothrombinase. So when you get prothrombinase out, you get more thrombin out. That makes more prothrombinase to be produced, which makes more thrombin to be produced. So this positive feedback loop causes for more and more and more thrombin ultimately to be produced in order to produce the fibrin threads which is our blood clotting protein. And our blood clot would look like this, all right? All right, so on the test, you need to know the order in which these clotting factors are activated. Factor seven is activated by tissue factor, which activates 10 and five in the presence of calcium. Act, uh, clotting factor 12 is activated by damaged platelets and endothelial cells and collagen fibers in the presence of calcium activates factor 10 and 5. Activated 10 and 5 is called prothrombinase, which activates prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin activates clotting factor 1, fibrinogen, into a solid, insoluble protein fiber called fibrin. And the fibrin molecule is what makes up our clot. That's why we call the blood clot 
a fibrin blood clot. These are fibrin threads. All right. Now, the last thing we have to talk about is blood clotting. I know I'm going quickly, so just go back and view the video or review your PowerPoint. And if you have a question, just email me, all right? Just want to try and get this done so we can get our chapter 24 completed on Thursday. All right, so on the test, you're going to have to know what makes up the blood types. And so the blood typing system that we are medically concerned with is the ABO blood typing system. If you give somebody the wrong type of ABO blood, you could kill them. But there are many, many, many different types of blood types that involve different types of antigens. They just don't cause a severe reaction if you give them the wrong ones. So we are gonna learn the ABO blood typing system, which is has four base blood types, type A, B, A, B, and O. In order to be type A, you have to have the A antigen in the surface of your red blood cell. And the A antigen and the B antigen both are glycolipid, by the way. So if you have the A antigen, you're type A. If you have the B antigen, you're type B. If you have both the A and the B antigen, then you're type AB. And if you have neither one of these, you don't have the A and you don't have the B, then you're type O. So that's pretty simple. Which antigen do you have or don't have directly tells you your blood type, right? Now, you also have to know which antibodies are in the plasma of the blood in order to learn which type of blood can be received from other types of blood. Like who can give blood to AB negative? Who can give blood to AB positive? Now, you can learn this whole chart and memorize it if you want, but you don't have to. It's pretty simple if you know the antibodies. Whatever antibody a person has is the type of blood you never want to give them. All right, so if somebody is type A, they have the A antigen, so the B antigen is not theirs, so their immune system produces anti-B antibodies. Now, you would never want to put any B type blood in any A type person, ever, because their anti-B antibody would react with the B antigen. And that's what you don't want to happen. So since A people have anti-B, they can't receive B blood because it has the B antigen on it. And they can't receive AB blood because it has the B antigen on it. So no A person can receive B or AB ever. The only blood an A person can get is type A and type O. Now, same thing for B people. Since B people have the anti-A antibody, you can't give them any blood on it that has the A antigen on it. So no B person can ever receive A or AB, ever, because they have the anti-A antibody. AB people can receive all four blood types because they don't have the anti-A nor the anti-B antibodies. So it really doesn't matter what blood type you give them, at least the base blood type because they don't have the antibodies to react to any of the antigens anyway. Now, O people, since they don't have the A nor the B antigen, they have both of the antibodies. They have anti-A and they have anti-B antibodies. Since they have the anti-A and the anti-B antibody, you can't give an O person any one of these blood types. There is no O person on the planet that can receive A or B or AB. So O people can only receive O, right? Now, there's another antigen. It's called the RH factor. So you notice on this blood type chart, I have A positive and A negative, B positive and B negative, so forth and so on. You need to know what type of blood types can go to an A positive versus an A negative person. What makes an A positive relative to an A negative as well? What is that? Well, I didn't put it on here. And it won't let me type on here, will it? There it goes. 
All right, so I'll just do it right here. There's a factor called the RH factor. It's just, the RH factor is just another antigen in the surface of the blood. About 80 to 85% of the population have the RH factor. If a blood type has the RH factor on it, it's called a positive blood type. So in a person who is type A, they have the A antigen. If they have the RH factor, they also are called A positive then. If you have a type A person that is missing the RH factor, it's called A negative. So any one of the blood types that has the RH factor in the surface of the red blood cell is called a positive blood type. So here's how you learn which types of blood people can receive without memorizing again. A people, no matter if it's positive or negative, can never get a B antigen. So A people can never get B blood or AB blood, never. So an A person can still only receive A and O. However, depending on if you're positive or negative, you can get different blood types. So for instance, an A person that's A positive can receive four blood types. They're still only base A and O. However, positive blood types can receive the positive types and the negative types of the types they can get. So A people can only get A and O, but an A positive person can receive positives and negatives of A's and O's. So A positive can get A positive and A negative, O positive and O negative. So without having to memorize that, you already know that A people can only get A and O. And now you know if it's a positive, a, a positive type, they can get the positives and the negatives of what they can get. Now the negatives can only get the negatives. So an A negative person can only get A negative and O negative. That's the only blood types they can get, all right? So I want you to learn what type of blood can uh, be received by all the blood types, all right? You should know that AB positive is called the universal recipient because AB positive can receive all eight blood types because AB people, remember, can receive all the blood types. And since an AB positive person being positive, they can receive the positives and the negatives of all the blood types they can get. So AB people can get A, B, AB, and O. AB positive can get A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, so forth and so on, all the way down to O positive and O negative. So these are the universal recipients. Now, the only people that can receive AB positive blood are AB positive people. No other blood type can receive AB positive blood ever, All right? So they are the universal recipient, but they can only give blood to themselves. The universal donor is O negative because all eight blood types can receive O negative, um, but O negative can only receive O negative. So the O negative people can give to everybody, but they can only receive from themselves. All right, so I need you to learn that. Now, the last thing in the chapter that we have to cover is hemolytic disease of a newborn. Um, I know all the people that are in lab already got this talk, so just bear with me. The people that are not in lab or didn't do it in their lab, um, you basically need to know what ROGAM is. I'm going to describe it in a second and what, how hemolytic disease of a newborn can come about. So I'm going to teach it from this picture. Hemolytic disease of a newborn is a disease that destroys the red blood cells of a baby growing in utero. And it can possibly develop this way. The setup has to be this. You have to have a mom who has a blood type that is RH negative. Any one of the blood types that's RH negative. She has to be an RH negative blood type that becomes pregnant with an RH positive baby. Now, the RH positive baby is growing in utero and the mom is okay, the baby is okay, nothing's wrong, right? However, because the mom's blood and the baby's blood do not mix. However, if the mom does not receive Rogam, which is this drug, 
Rogam blocks the mom's immune system from ever producing anti-RH antibodies. So that's what this drug is for. All females that are RH negative get Rogam. All females that go in and that they don't know the blood type get Rogam. RH positive females do not get Rogam because they don't need it. But the mom receives Rogam and it prevents the mom's body from producing anti-RH antibodies, all right? Now, if the mom did not get Rogam, at birth, the placenta rips away from the uterine wall and there's a little bit of mixing of mommy's blood and baby's blood. So the RH antigens from the baby's blood get into the mom's body. The mom's immune system recognizes the RH factor as being foreign and starts to produce anti-RH antibodies. This is wherein lies the whole problem. You never want an RH negative person, especially a female, you never want their immune system to ever produce anti-RH antibodies. Now this female that started producing anti-RH antibodies now should not have babies again. She should not get pregnant again because her unborn baby could possibly die from he hemolytic disease of a newborn. The first baby's fine, hopefully. I mean, it's not hurting from this. The first baby's delivered and everything's good. Without Rogam, the mom's immune system starts to make anti-RH antibodies. Those anti-RH antibodies have the ability to cross the placenta and get from the mom's blood into the baby's blood. So guess what the anti-RH antibodies do in the baby's blood? It destroys the baby's red blood cells. And the fetus, the unborn baby, gets very sick. At the worst, the, well, the worst thing that can happen is a baby can die in utero and be stillborn. The best case scenario, the baby gets sick and is still born, but is sick. So the severity of the case depends on uh, the mom's immune response to the uh, antigen, how many antibodies she produced. Sometimes the baby is still born. Sometimes the baby is just born sick. Sometimes the baby is born very sick. It just depends. So to prevent the mom from producing these anti-RH antibodies, the mom receives Rogam before and after delivery. And so what does Rogam do? It blocks the mom's immune system from ever recognizing the baby's RH antigen and prevents the anti-RH antibodies from ever being produced. So the scenario that you see here, after the first pregnancy without Rogam, the mom makes antibodies against RH. Those anti-RH antibodies then can always damage or hurt the unborn baby, the second, the third, the fourth pregnancy, if the baby is RH positive. Now, if she becomes pregnant with an RH negative baby, then the baby would not be hurt. It's only RH positive babies that can be hurt. All right, so that's it for the blood chapter. Make sure you know the scenario for hemolytic disease of a newborn, how it comes about. Oh, the older name for that is called erythroblastosis fatalis. You might see that in my notes. Erythroblastosis fatalis, or hemolytic disease of a newborn, is abbreviated HDN, by the way. Um, know your blood typing chart. Who can give blood to whom? Um, know your sequence of events for the activation of the clotting factors for the fibrin blood clot. Know the platelet plug formation. And make sure you know the functions of the white blood cells and all of that off of these tables. I'm just telling you some major points to focus on. Um, I think I have a question on immigration. That's not too bad though. Um, no erythropoiesis, how we make red blood cells in the red bone marrow. And no the stimulating factor is oxygen delivery directly. So how much oxygen is in the blood means something. So if the blood's not very oxygenated for whatever purpose, the kidneys are sensitive to that and they release EPO. So follow this flow chart. 
oh, know the breakdown components of a red blood cell and the breakdown of these pigments. Just follow your flow chart again. Know the functions of hemoglobin. You don't have to identify the picture, but you need to know the structure. For instance, red blood cells are biconcave. They're loaded down with hemoglobin. And so what is hemoglobin? Well, it's four polypeptide chains with the heme groups in them. You don't have to identify them, but you need to know the heme group has an iron ion in it, and that's what reversibly binds to oxygen. You need to know the committed stem cells and what they develop into, and that all of this uh, leuco, uh, hemopoiesis occurs in the red bone marrow, all right? So that was just a little quick overview of the blood. I know I went through it pretty quick, but just review that in this video. If you have any questions, just email me those. All right, I'm gonna stop recording now.